thanks everybody for staying to the end here. Um, we do have some cases uh, from one of the audience members that we'll go through uh, in a minute. If anybody else has any cases that they would uh, like to share with us, please do. All right, so we're going to go through these kind of quickly in the interest of time. So um, this is a 68-year-old male who um, is a large guy. Uh, I did his uh, right side in 2008. Both of these are for just standard osteoarthritis. There's no tricks here. I did the left side in 2011, and he did fine. He came back in 2019 uh, in January, and he said, my left knee is hurting. Um, so uh, these are his x-rays in uh, January of 2019, and uh, we have a few issues there listed that I thought we should discuss. You can see his bone scan there. I don't think the diagnosis is much of a mystery, but which one of you gentlemen would like to start with this? I'll take I'll, t I'll, st I'll get us kicked off here. Um, so this is, this is actually, uh, I think it's fairly uh, suspicious that the tibia is loose. Um, uh, and so I'd probably go on what I see there with the cracked cement and the radiolucent line and compare it to uh, previous implants. Um, I'd still probably get it, or pre excuse me, previous x-rays. I'd still get some serology to rule out uh, infection. But one thing the bone scan does offer here is it's, it's focused on the tibia. <coughs> Uh, I think if the situation were more equivocal, where the patient had pain, it was around the tibia, you weren't sure, uh, that would be the, the unusual case, I think, where a bone scan would, in fact, be helpful to uh, focus on one component, and that might drive your decision-making in terms of the revision plan. Okay. Yeah, all good points. He had a normal ESR and CRP, and even with that, due to my suspicion of infection, I, he's a normal host, so to speak. but. Uh, I had a high suspicion that he may be infected, so I did an aspiration anyways, and that was negative as well. So Hutch, I think uh, Ted brings up a good point. With digital x-ray, you have the ability to bring up serial x-rays over time, and if you do have different <laughs> time points, any one x-ray may not look that abnormal, but when you look at a post-op film and then sequential films, it becomes very obvious the implant has subtly changed position, and it may not be that obvious on one x-ray. No, I think that's a great point. Anything else to add, Mike? How, uh, so we, we make the diagnosis of the tibials loose. I tell them we're going to do the operation. And so questions uh, that I had about this case is, you know, it's a big guy. He has a BMI of only 36, and his bone quality <coughs> was excellent. And uh, I actually did the right side three years earlier, and it's doing fine. And, uh, you know, I made the decision in 2008. I might not have thought of using a stem in this patient, but uh, in 2019 I might. Um, but it's interesting that the right side, uh, with essentially same size implants, same surgical technique, same radiographic outcome, uh, didn't get loose and the left side did. So I think that's worth a comment whether we should be using a stem or not. And then in, in terms of the revision, would you be inclined to revise both um, or would you just revise uh, the tibia? Uh, well, in terms of the stem and the primary, I probably would use the stem in both. Of course, it's easy to sit here and say that now. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something that you kind of have to think of at the time of surgery or do routinely in these kind of patients. I, I'm surprised that the, you know, the second one loosened. And uh, the only other thing about the radiographs that can be helpful is sometimes the tibia just subsides a little bit and you can see it more as a change in alignment when you compare the different films. As far as, uh, um, but I don't know why it loosened other than he's a big guy. And, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, I would revise both uh, components. I think the, you know, the femur's been in there a while. It is a lot easier to expose the, the tibia when the femur's not in the way. So you can do a much better job of the tibia. And I think the, uh, by getting the femur revised and, you know, if you don't revise the femur, it might loosen in a couple of years anyway. The other, thing that, that I think warrants discussion in this is uh, that I think about a lot is how to handle the revision to mitigate the risk of this happening a second time. And this is where the cones come into play because the cone, you know, the cones were kind of made to fill bone defects, but they are an area of osteointegration. And if that ingrows, you know, it shouldn't loosen again. So I think a cone would be indicated here for not bone loss, but to get some uh, biologic fixation. And then I'd use a, a considerably longer stem uh, than maybe other things to, uh, to protect the cone. 
And would you um, cement the entire stem or would you leave it cementless and engage the diaphysis? So uh, the, the uh, Mayo technique where you fully cement a shorter stem, I probably would not do here. I'd probably use a longer press fit stem. It'd be the one indication that I, I have for a press fit stem. Most of the revisions I do now, I do with a short fully cemented stem and a bone plug and stuff and a cone. But here, I really want to, you know, the long press fit stem to kind of keep me in the right alignment and to uh, protect the cone and get the thing to ingrow. But it's a little narrower stem, so I'd use a, you know, like a 10 or 11 millimeter diameter stem to avoid end stem pain. Okay, great. I think those are all good points. We're telling our residents and fellows now that you should be looking for reasons not to use a cone at this point rather than why you, you should use the cone. So, You know, I think the other thing, Hachi, I mean, in 2011, I wouldn't have used a longer stem. I would now, just knowing what we know, so I can't throw stones about that. And I think what Mike says works really well. The other option, which I prefer, is using a metaphyseal sleeve and a press fit stem. Again, getting cementless fixation. The metaphysis were generally have pretty good bone. You certainly don't have a defect. Um, the stem provides alignment and stability while you get ingrowth. The stem doesn't give you fixation because it's press fit. Um, and I, I would definitely revise both sides because you don't want to revise the tibia and then three years later come back because the femur's loose. And it, in 2019, getting off a well-fixed femoral component is not a big challenge, and you have the ability of either uh, cones or sleeves to deal with any kind of bone defect you create in the process of removing stuff. So, great. Um, so we uh, took them to the operating room, and... Um, I have always been under the philosophy that I'm going to try to do as little as possible. I think uh, your guys' points about uh, not wanting to have to come back and revise the femur in several years is, is a good one. And there's no question that an isolated tibial revision is a little bit more challenging than uh, taking the femur off and having better exposure. Uh, but if you work at it, I think you can get it in, in uh, just about all cases. Uh, it's a rare case that you can't get good exposure with external rotation and a good medial peel and anterior drawer. So I, I left his femur. Um, and as you can see there, we used a, a comb and uh, rather than use just a short, shorter stem, I kind of went with an intermediate length stem and my intent was to have a two centimeter distal mantle, not a four centimeter distal mantle. So we pressurized him pretty good because he's a big, big guy. So anyways, he did just fine. Uh, and I was happy with that. And uh, he came back at eight weeks. He usually, I usually get folks in at six weeks, but he was a little late. He came in, he said, I was great at six weeks. And then I got out of the shower and um, I was on my left leg and I kind of twisted and uh, ever since then, I, I had some pain and then it quieted down. And ever since then, I've had some pain, feels a little bit unstable, and I'm, I'm feeling some clicking. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are his eight-week post-operative x-rays. Anything unusual there? First of all, I would have done exactly what you did here, Hutch. I don't know that there's uh, evidence to make me believe that the femur is going to come loose three years later. I just uh, I haven't seen that. So, But now that you mentioned this history, I'm, I'm scrutinizing the polyethylene there, and I can't tell for sure, but uh, I'm wondering if it's if it's seated or if it's kind of squirting out the front there. Yeah, just in terms of one versus both on the revision side, so you're going to see some data from Tom Farron coming out supporting uh, a, a fairly large uh, K-series of isolated tibial revisions that did just well. <coughs> so the dogma that you re need to revise everything is uh, definitely going to be challenged, and uh, I think it's really dealer's choice. There's good evidence to do both. <coughs> so uh, I, I had a PGY2 in my clinic uh, when this guy came in, and um, he, I think it was the second time he was in my clinic. I don't know him very well. And uh, he said to me, yeah, this guy, he was doing fine, but uh, his polyethylene has um, uh, come out of the log detail. And I kind of laughed. I was eating my lunch. I said, what are you talking about? Uh, let me take a look at that. So I turned around, and I looked at the x-ray, and I said, oh, gosh, you, you might be right. <laughs> so uh, you can see there, and if you don't know this implant, um, uh, y you wouldn't necessarily be able to appreciate how much of that shadow is proud anteriorly, but it definitely shouldn't be that way. So um, his knee felt a little bit unstable, and he did have some clicking. So um, I told him, you know, this is not this is the first time I've ever seen this, and uh, I don't know why it happened. It could be me. I could have left cement in the lock detail. Uh, there could be a problem with the tray. There could be a problem with the insert. Um, but uh, you know, I recommend that you have it redone. So. Uh, we took him to the operating room, and um, uh, the polyethylene had indeed uh, come out anteriorly, and uh, fortunately he didn't have any metallosis. And uh, we did not just change the insert. I could not find anything wrong with the lock detail, and I couldn't find any cement anywhere. Uh, so 
Um, hopefully this is a freak issue. My concern is that there's a defect in the tibial uh, tray and that we might be back, but we'll wait and see. I, I think that this issue just warrants a little discussion. It's extremely rare, but my question probably to the panel is, um, what do you guys do after you put the insert in to make sure it's in? Do you just look at it and um, um, say, okay, that looks good, or do you manually test it? Because I kind of do both now. Yeah, I, th I think it's an excellent nuance to bring up, Mike, here. So the, the, uh, in the system that I use, you can put the polyethylene in, and if it's not engaged in the detail in the back, it'll go down in the front, and yep. it'll look like it's seated. And, and so to answer your question, what you have to do is look around the side, put a little, you know, um, like Freer. a tonsil or something and yep. make sure that it's actually engaged in the back. I always look at that uh, because I think it's possible to look seated in front and not be actually engaged. Yeah, I've seen the same thing. I think we may use the same system and it, it'll look down and not be down. And if it's down, you can't put a freer between the metal and the polyethylene. If it's not down, it'll look seated, but you can put a freer in the side that's not completely seated. So you can definitely get faked out that this looks like this is locked in place, but Tad brings up a great point. You want to look around, make sure it's seated all the way around, and that you can't, it depends on the implant system you're using, but whatever it is, you want to make sure that that poly is really locked in place, because I've had this happen. What, one other follow-up thing is what you do if you think it might not be down. So there's two things you can do. One is you can take out the mallet and hit it a couple more times. The other is you can take the poly out, irrigate the locking mechanism, and look around and make sure there's nothing you know, there, and then put the poly back in. And after hitting them a bunch of times, I've kind of come to the conclusion that the other way is the better way to go. And, and you know the other thing Mike there's usually a reason and when I've done that you pop out the poly you go and look and I've found like a little piece of cement yeah. flipped over the back part of the locking mechanism I mean a very very small piece but it'll com it'll block the poly from actually locking in so there's usually a reason it's soft tissue yep. cement piece of bone something and you got to look for that and if you've banged it a whole bunch of times usually you've screwed up the polyethylene so you got to get a new liner okay. yeah all, all great points and a, a rare thing to have happen, but anyways, we'll, we'll see. All right, uh, next case, uh, and, and uh, these next two cases I actually need some help on. So this is a 62-year-old female. She's uh, thin and quite fit, um, and she, gets, uh, she moves um, from San Francisco to Palo Alto, and uh, her surgeon uh, moved uh, a couple hundred miles away from San Francisco. And uh, she, you know, wants to try to get her care in Palo Alto. So she comes to see me uh, and uh, she says, um, you know, I've had uh, multiple revisions and um, my knee doesn't really hurt very much. I can still be pretty active, but uh, it definitely feels stiff and it's always uh, swollen. And, um, you know, I think if you just take this fluid out of my knee uh, periodically, everything is going to be just fine. Um, can you do that for me? And oh, by the way, my hip really hurts. Uh, and I have really arthritis and I need a hip replacement and I, I do have a history of infection and I've had uh, at least one two-stage exchange and maybe two. Um, so what do you want to uh, uh, do to help me? Bill, why don't you start with this one? So there, there's actually not any tricks here. So I'll tell you, so she, she uh, is not infected, uh, proven many times. Um, now, does she have an organism that we can't pick up? Possibly, but I did not get NGS on her. Um, for the reasons that we talked about. Um, it looks like the implants are well fixed. I don't think anything's loose. Uh, she has a little bit of an extensor lag, but it doesn't bother her at all. And she says her knee definitely does not feel unstable. Um, and so there's sort of two issues here. One, would you do the hip replacement with a knee that's not functioning well that you think is infected until proven otherwise? And uh, I saw her multiple times, and then I finally bit the bullet and did the hip replacement, and <coughs> she, she's done well from that, uh, luckily. Um, but I really just want some advice. So, um, you know, I, I aspirated her, I think, three times, and each time 150 cc's. It's uh, kind of dark, kind of red, not blood. But, but thin. And it's not blood. It's just a little red, a little dark, but thin. Definitely not frank blood. And so 
her hip's not infected. This didn't no, no. So I did. So when I saw her originally, she <laughs> didn't have a hip replacement. Okay. I, I saw her for about a year before uh, I agreed to do anything. But uh, her hip is perfectly fine. So that's that right hip replacement you did. Yeah, that's what I did. And some of my concern was maybe you know her gait's off because of her hip arthritis. So we'll do the hip, and and maybe this will change. I said probably not, but you know we can do that for you. So we did do that. So her extension extensor <coughs> mechanism functions is not yes, perfect. Just not but perfect. She can ambulate without a brace. That doesn't bother her. Yeah. Yeah. You know, these are some of the toughest patients. What makes, I mean, I've had this happen with a primary <coughs> knee, and you keep asking, well, what is going on? And sometimes you'll get a hemarthrosis, and Dick Scott would talk about where he'd get a piece of synovium. It's like biting your cheek, and it bleeds. You get a hemarthrosis, and it goes away with time. What's confounding here is you've got this hinge prosthesis, extensor mechanism screwed up, and could this just be purely a mechanical problem, and she's getting <coughs> recurrent effusions? I mean, obviously, it's infected till proven otherwise, but it seems like you've kind of proven it's not <coughs> infected. Um, that's, that's a challenge. Yeah, I, don't, I would just take a wait-and-see approach here. I thought in this case you are going to take us to a, a periprosthetic fracture. Uh, this is not infected. It's not painful. It's an effusion. Um, it's not loose that we've demonstrated. Uh, I would just follow it and try to discourage the aspiration bit unless it's really bothering her a lot to get, so it doesn't get infected. Yeah. Oh, so I tried very hard. Um, so finally she said, I'm so desperate that I will do anything. And I, I told her, and this, I don't think we're going to be able to fix your problem. What, what's she desperate about? What's the desperation? The, is the symptoms are the effusion. Yes. That, the effusion That's really, is the problem. The effusion is the problem. Which is the cause of her stiffness and pain. Yep. Is it painful? Yeah, a little bit. Not bad, though. Yeah, I mean, it's, come on. It's, it's this has got a huge dead space, uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not going to be optimal. I, don't, I mean, I think this is the art of medicine. I don't know this patient, but I would really be trying to uh, push her off. Sounds like you have, and you're kind of feeling stuck, but, uh, boy, I don't well, know what the intervention is here, Hutch. I, I mean, one other question, Hutch. What, when did the effusions start? Did they start a long, long, long time ago before all these operations, or has it been kind of like since this extensor mechanism situation? Yes, yeah, since um, her last replantation. Since her, so before that, she didn't have the effusions? No. She doesn't have uh, some polyethylene button floating around in there loose, does she? I didn't think so. No. Um, so, but I mean, are the... Because the extensor mechanism, I mean, you know, you say it's not bad, but it looks pretty bad. Yeah. And, um, but it functions. Yeah, I get that. But, uh, you know, what's the cause of her effusions? If the effusions kind of happened as a result, at the same time that extensor mechanism went north, I'd probably go in there and try to, you know, Marlex mesh it and get it back down, and maybe that'll make things better. But I, I don't know the, the etiology of the effusions. Effusions usually are either due to instability or, um, or they're due to uh, patellar impingement, crepitus, kind of synovitis. And there's not going to be any instability here. Mm -hmm. So, Hutch, is that a metaphyseal sleeve, not a cone on the tibia? Both sides. Yeah, you know, Sleeves I, on both sides. I had a patient like this I was just convinced was crazy, and finally she wore me down. I took her back, and the, the stem and uh, tray had mildly dissociated from the sleeve, so the Morris taper had broken. And so when I went in there, there was, I expected to find nothing. And as soon as I opened the arthrotomy, there was this kind of dark green fluid from metal on metal wear. And she had been right all along, and she was having pain from that, and she had recurrent effusions, never infected. Did, and did you, had you aspirated her? Could you I'd see? I'd aspirated, but, you know, it didn't look that bad, and I don't think I did. I think one of our PAs did on a couple of occasions. So, actually, you could, I could just pull the, the tray and stem out of the sleeve. It was a 14, so it would come out, and... Um, that was the cause of her problem. I mean, this does have a bunch of modular connections. 150 cc's is a really big effusion, mm -hmm. and those those are painful when they're that big. I mean, the normal knee holds about 60 cc's of fluid, and then you know it's full. Yeah. So I, I've seen the dissociation on the femoral side several times. So I thought about that, and we got serum metal levels; they were normal. Um, so that was less suspicious. Plus, it didn't uh, you know our fluid wasn't terribly dark. But anyways. Um, 
So she wore me down and uh, I said, okay, fine, these are your options. You know, we, you can do nothing, which I hope you did, but you haven't done that, so I can't do that now. And it's reasonable to do a synovectomy and change the insert uh, yep. and uh, keep our fingers crossed. We looked into a radiation synovectomy. That's not allowed in the United States. Um, so I said, I can get you somebody to do it in, in Europe or Canada if you want to do that. And she's like, well, let's just try the synovectomy and the insert exchange. Um, so uh, we did that. Uh, and... Um, is this the next case? Yeah, so we did that, and uh, she's now, uh, I think, nine months post-op, and uh, her effusion's probably about 30 cc's now, and, and she actually has full extension with an outer lag. She had robust scar tissue uh, around where her patellar tendon should be, so we were prepared to do some of the extensor mechanism if we could, but we chose not to. Um, so I, I'm concerned that she's going to get more effusions, and I honestly think she, her, so she's, uh, she has very uh, paper-thin soft tissue envelope, and so uh, my concern is this is going to come back. Uh, and if it comes back, I've, I've just read there was a recent report of doing an embolization um, yep. of the collateral um, vessels. <coughs> and uh, I told her, you know, this is promising. There's somebody in the States now doing this, and they've published a series with pretty good results. So we could at least look at it. Yeah. How, and she how, actually didn't have much synovitis. How old was the poly that you replaced? Um, not very old. Like a max two years. I don't remember for sure. It could have been less than that. could have been a year. So you didn't see any other cause of the effusion? Nothing. The implants were stable? Oh, yeah. Stable. No, we, we banged on both sides. They were stable. Rock stable. Mm. So we'll see. Not necessarily a good solution. All right. NS. Um, so this is a 68-year-old female. She's 4'11", 230. BMI 43. Um, she has big extensor lag. She wears a brace. She uses a walker. She actually exercises on a treadmill every day. Um, and uh, she has a little scar in the front of her knee and uh, occasionally it drains something. It's done that for years. Um, and uh, her last operation was uh, probably th three or four years before she came to see me. Uh, and she said, you know, I got this big uh, swollen knee and it kind of hurts and this thing drains uh, uh, a couple times a year and I can't get it to heal and, uh, you know, is there anything you can do to make me better? So I said, probably not and this is one lady you want nothing to do with. So uh, I tried for 18 months and eventually you get worn down. <laughs> so um, her infection workup is definitely negative, uh, including alpha defensin. Um, and uh, you can see the bone scan there. So, um, any takers on this one? Well, what do you make of the uh, the drainage? I mean, yeah. I, I just that I, I'm I'm believing this thing is infected, regardless of the alpha defensin. And how about the 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 cell count? Was that normal? Yeah, it was less than 500, and it was about 35 PMNs. Where, where does it drain from? Directly uh, in the mid portion of her incision. H have you ever seen it? I mean, in the office, uh, where it's draining, um, or is this just no. something she tells you? Something she tells me, but she came back one time, and uh, it was definitely the escar w was uh, immature. Let's put it that way. So I believe her that it drains. She's a completely normal patient. Yeah, you know. It <laughs> This is one of those ones that sure seems like it's got to be infected, and maybe we're just not, uh, I mean, checked for fungus and all the other odd things. Yeah. And Every, was, everything. I mean, she's fungus. obviously been, you know, round the block a couple of times orthopedically. Is, was this previously infected? It's never been infected, and she does have a whole extensor mechanism allograft in. Oh, I mean, she has a whole extensor mechanism Yeah, that's a whole allograft. extensor mechanism allograft. Okay, well. It's failed. Non-functioning, but. Uh, this looks like something that probably drifted down to you for me when I was at UCSF. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but I chose these cases for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just giving you some good follow-up on your patient. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Hansen knows some of these, too. <laughs> and this is welcome to This Is Your Life. Uh, she's just a little uh, not short that far, for her know. weight is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> All right, so I'll just make a long story short. So I, I, the femur looked like it was loose, um, and I didn't know whether the tibia was uh, loose or not. Yep. Uh, and so her infection workup was negative. So I said, I honestly think that you're infected, but we can't prove that. Um, and I said, if you're not infected, the only thing I can think of is that your skin is paper thin, and uh, the pressure from the effusion uh, is causing uh, you to have this escar that won't heal. And I said, I ha haven't seen that before, but it does make sense. Um, and so my preference would be to do nothing. Well, she wouldn't tolerate that. One other consideration. I, I do think that some people get allergic reactions to the allograft. 
and um, you know they get stuff like this happening if it's not infected yeah. and um, so it can be a allograft etiology of a biologic situation there with a big huge effusion and all that swelling in the front of the knee um, but uh, I, I agree with Tad I mean there's so much stuff here that sounds like it's infected that would be uh, my biggest concern I think you know to support your point Mike there there's there's just that huge mass of soft tissue in the front of the knee it could be something is draining that is separate from the uh, the joint but I, I feel like I'm sticking my head in the sand not not believing it's infected but I guess it's possible so what if it's truly not infected and the femur's loose and you've got a non-functioning allograft would you ever consider revising the femur and trying to do like a Marlex mesh to get to get some sort of functioning extensor mechanism? I, mean, I think I think that's reasonable, but I think you've got to deal with the you've got to you've got to get rid of the intermittent drainage issue. You've got to solve that problem before you go in there with a new uh, femoral component and an, and an allograft or mesh, whatever you want to do. I, I think that that needs to be solved. I think the you know the smartest thing might not be what you did and might not be what I would do, uh, but the smartest thing, if you could talk me into it, would just be to take everything out, put in a rod spacer, and then start out all over again uh, as a do a staged thing uh, with see what's left after it comes out, which is you know not going to be a lot, and um, uh, uh, do a two stage with a, a rod spacer because there's such massive bone loss, loss of ligaments, um, tibial tubercle and stuff like that, and then do a second stage including a Marlex mesh. Uh, I think that's probably the right thing to do. Okay. So I gave her that as an option. I told her, you know, I'm, I'm not optimistic that we'll ever be able to fix your extensor mechanism because there's not much bone to anchor anything to distally. Um, so uh, I gave her all, all those options. I said, we think the femur's definitely loose. And I said, if the tibia is loose, then we're just going to take it out and uh, give you a pseudofusion and maybe come back another day. And she was fine with that option. And, but I said, if the tibia is well fixed, which I can't tell for sure right now, uh, I don't really want to dig that out. And I think the best thing to do for you would be to give you um, a segmental distal replacement. Um, and uh, that's what I hope would be the best outcome. But I said, we're probably not going to be able to fix your extensor lag. And she was fine with all that. She's very reasonable. So um, the problem is that this company does not have a, a segmental femoral replacement. So yep. there's no way to make up for that bone loss. Uh, yep. But, you know, you can stack a bunch of cones and yeah, things. Yeah, that, that would be the option, you stack cones. Yeah. So um, we uh, took her to the operating room. The tibia was well fixed. Uh, I, too, have seen a few cases where the extensor mechanism whole allograft uh, just sort of looks like it's being rejected and it's all thickened, and that was my suspicion that was what was contributing to her fusions as well as a loose uh, tibia. Um, but I told her that if, if the tibia is well fixed, I'm going to put another femoral implant into you and cement it loosely, and we're going to take measurements and we're going to get you a custom distal femur built. Uh, and she said, that, okay, that's fine with me. So uh, that's essentially what we've done. So I, I uh, took a new femur and cemented it in there fairly loosely. Um, and uh, we took some measurements and we now have a custom uh, distal femoral implant for her. Uh, and she's now, I think, uh, eight months post-op. Um, she has a trace effusion. Uh, I revised her scar and everything's healed up. It looks great. And she actually uh, is now just walking with a cane, not a walker, and she's still exercising. And she says it really feels great. And I've, I've cautioned her that this is going to fail. It's just a matter of when. And, you know, we have the uh, custom ready for you to go if need be. So, so what, what's going on with the extensor mechanism? Um, so it was uh, kind of frayed uh, and uh, hadn't really uh, integrated much into the host tissue. Okay. So she has nothing there now. So she's using drop lock hinge brace or something? Yeah, she, uh, yeah it, she, it just is um, uh, a knee brace, though it does not incorporate her foot. But now, now in retrospect, what do you make of the drainage when you opened it up? So it? We, we took biopsies. It said chronic inflammation, no concerns for so acute. So it was an allograft rejection. It was an allograft kind of rejection, thing. yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, um, they have some parts in them that you can get rejected from, uh, particularly the uh, soft tissue component of it. Actually, the, the bone, I think, is, is less immunogenic. Stay tuned. 
Um, why don't we do, Steve, do you want to do your cases? How much time we have? We have about 15 minutes, so if you want to do your cases, that'd be great. Great. Uh, my name's Steve Smith. I'm from Santa Rosa. Anyway, these are some difficult patients. I, I'm not sure what to do with. A uh, 65-year-old female had a traumatic injury, 1974. Progressive pain and, and loss of motion. Right now, she's about um, minus 20 to 90 degrees range of motion. Quads strength is four minus, you know, over five. Complains of pain all the time. Uh, she likes cigarettes, alcohol. Uh, she's not particularly heavy. Um, she has COPD. You said she likes cigarettes and alcohol? She does like, yeah, okay. cigarettes and alcohol. <laughs> um, Still most people? With, but anyway, my question is, uh, if we can show some of the other pictures on here. Um, the, you know, Patel is in a kind of a rough position there, yeah. and I, my question is, uh, I mean, what, what do you do? What, what could you do? What would you guys Steve, do? Steve, what's the status of her extensor mechanism? What? Her extensor mechanism, what's the status of her quads function? And uh, the they fire, but I don't think there's co a connection there anymore. Okay. Okay. 20 degree lag. D right. And did she, she had a prior quadricep something or other injury? She, she didn't have any, no, she didn't, she was put in a cast, never had, they did something to her on, you know, on a condom, maybe a ligament uh, injury. Okay. But uh, nothing, it was, a, there's an incision off on the lateral side, but nothing anteriorly. Okay. But um, can she, it looks like there's, you know, she's got a quadriceps disruption or, you know, issue with that. Is that your clinical impression? Yes. Okay. So, so she's got a non-functioning or, you know, partial or complete quads tear or repair or something like that. Right. Okay. Okay. I think I got it. So. Go back, uh, go back to the AP then? Yeah. So oh, I can, can see why you're showing this case. It's not straightforward. Yeah, I'll go forward. Just go forward. Uh, I think it's, there you go. There we go. Oh, I can? Okay. Okay, so she's in quite a bit of valgus, had probably some ligament thing, and uh, however it happened, her quadriceps is uh, sort of chronically ruptured. And it looks like her medial collateral is probably lax at best. Yep, I agree. Maybe you. worse. We don't know that for sure. Uh, so you got an extensor mechanism problem, an alignment problem, probably a ligamentous instability issue. Um, uh, let's go back to the lateral now and just see how bad the patella baja is. That's pretty it's bad. bad. It's, it's about as bad, bad as it gets. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I think if it were not for the extensor mechanism, you could probably fix this with maybe uh, you might have to use a varus valgus constrained knee because I bet the MCL will probably take up tension once you release the lateral side. Question becomes what to do with the extensor mechanism. You really want to try and solve this all in one false swoop if you can. And so I think you're going to have to just do some form of extensor mechanism reconstruction. I think the, the most reliable in 2019 is probably using Marlex to, okay. to redo that. So would you guys... Um uh, do a padelectomy to get rid of that ugly lump in front of the knee, or would you do a big tubule tubical osteotomy and move it eight inches proximally to get it back to its normal spot? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. I, I would definitely not do the tubercle osteotomy. Yeah, I don't, I don't I mean. think you could get it up there. Uh, and I, it's an interesting question about the patella. I think what I would uh, do, I agree that you're going to need to do the um, quad reconstruction, but if the patella is inhibiting the flexion, then I might, uh, this might be an indication to take out the patella and just do a, tr a more of a if it, classic, if you will, or as described, Marlex mesh reconstruction, get that patella out of the way, because it, could, it yep. could be impeding uh, both your flexion and extension just by its physical presence in, it, in its given location. I agree. I think, I hate taking out patellas, but I think this is one that you have to do a patellectomy uh, do your constrained knee, and then uh, put the Marlex mesh somehow to connect the extensor mechanism. Yeah, that's right. Good. Yeah, I think you uh, keep soft, because you want to have soft tissue on either side of the Marlex, so you, you want to get rid of the patella, but whatever you can preserve deep to that to put on the deep side of the, of the mesh, just so you don't have the mesh rubbing against the femoral component. 
But mm-hmm. I would agree. I don't, I don't think that patella is going to serve any good. Do any of you have uh, concerns about doing the extensor mechanism reconstruction at the time of the primary total knee since you have competing interests? Uh, yep. Therapy. Yep. So the good news is that you can take the Marlex mesh and cement it in with the tibia. So it's a very easy way to get distal fixation of the tibia. The bad news is that you've got to mobilize the knee in extension for eight weeks and uh, it'll get stiff. And um, I think it, it just depends what you want more, extensor mechanism function or knee motion, but you're not going to get both. Uh, and I think the extensor mechanism function trumps it. So, you know, you mobilize it maybe somewhere in the middle, maybe six weeks, four to six weeks, depending on how it looks, rather than the um, classic description Arlen had of 12 weeks, and then uh, see what you get. Yeah, but I also think there's another way to look at it, too. Uh, you're, and Eric makes a really good point, but you may be compromising your knee motion by leaving the patella in there and not doing the extensor mechanism because the reality is that uh, mm. it's not going to bend, uh, you know, if you if you don't address that at the beginning. So, yeah, it is a little bit of a compromise, but um, I, I agree with you, Mike. Yeah, I think this is maybe a discussion you talked about earlier. Do you want a higher risk of loosening and better function? Or, I mean, there's no good way to solve this problem. There's going to be a compromise one way or another, and I think it's probably easier to do this all at once than rather than trying to stage it. So just a question for the panel, given this is a little bit of a complex primary, and this patient uh, apparently likes uh, cigarettes and alcohol, how would you handle that part of it? Well, I, I don't know how, how big a problem the alcohol is. That'd be something to investigate. But certainly the cigarettes. Uh, this is you're, you're embarking on something that's complex. I'd really like to see the patient engaged at least, get her to agree to quit smoking and prove that she did. And if she's an alcoholic, well, then that's that needs to be addressed as well. I, mean, I think this is a chronic situation, and that under those circumstances, I would want to engage the patient to be involved. And part of her involvement is dealing with those two issues yeah you know you'll never have a bigger carrot than this and so if you can't get them to quit smoking to get this fixed then they're never going to quit smoking and so we've adopted fortunately all my partners agree that we won't operate on people if their serum coating is is positive so we just keep delaying them until they're smoke free for at least six weeks and i think particularly in something like this where you're going to have some soft tissue healing and these are all things that smoking impacts significantly you got to have them be on board because if they're not willing to do that then they'll probably take their cast off at a month and wreck your extensor reconstruction yes uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. So one of the uh, indications I consider for a primary hinge, the MCL here is pretty deficient, big valgus deformity and all that, so it's going to need constraint. But a deficient extensor mechanism does better with a hinge than it does with a constrained condyler. So, you know, because the hinge has that stop and everything. Uh, and I would have the hinge available depending on how the extensor mechanism looked at the time of surgery. But if I wasn't really happy with the extensor mechanism, I'd use the hinge instead of the constraint collar. Just to play devil's advocate here, I, I have uh, several cases that uh, maybe not uh, this bad of patella baja, but close. And um, sometimes when you uh, debride the scar tissue uh, around the patellar tendon uh, and in the lateral gutter, you do get some increased excursion of that patellar tendon. Uh, and I've also been impressed, extensor mechanism uh, deficiency aside, um, that uh, some of these patients have great flexion to start with. And uh, uh, postoperatively, if you leave it how it is, uh, I've been impressed with how much motion they get postop as well. And that just has to do with the length of their quadriceps tendon and, and their quadriceps muscles. Um, but uh, I, I personally would have everything that these guys talked about, but I, I wouldn't commit to any of those right away. Um, the other thing you can do is nibble away some of the inferior pole of the patella without compromising the patellar tendon insertion, and that may help you as well. Yeah, I think that's fair. Don't worry about how the x-ray looks. Just see how does it function. All right, any other questions about this one? Good case. Yeah. Do you have another one? I do. I'd like to sell this one, too. Um, it's a 88-year-old female. Trans- she goes all over the world. Uh, she's had a leg link discrepancy most of her life. Uh, she fell, I think she was in the Himalayas or something like that, got flown out. Uh, they fixed her uh, hip. She had an intertroch, and it's uh, had 
had to be healed and everything. Anyway, long story short, she's got a real painful right knee and she wants it fixed. Now she's 88, she's pretty healthy, although she had a taver, I think about a year ago, you know, to open up uh, her aortic valve. Otherwise she's pretty good shape. Um, and she's got a range of motion, minus 15 to 100 quad powers, five or five. Uh, she's got some spinal stenosis at four, five and L5 S1, but it's not critical at this point. Uh, she doesn't have any symptoms. Um, I find these extremely difficult people with a flexion and this kind of much valgus deformity, and I kind of wanted to know how you guys would go about fixing this. Yes, sir. You know, it sure looks like on this film, like she's opening up pretty significantly on the medial side. She doesn't have a ton of bone loss laterally. I mean, you can have a horrible valgus knee, but if you've eroded the bone, often the MCL is intact. This to me is a bit more worrisome than the previous one where uh, it was stretched a bit, but uh, you know, this is a case where definitely I have a hinge available because I'm not, particularly at 88, I, I wouldn't have a real problem with that. If in fact the medial side is insufficient, you can't balance it. Yeah, I find the more of these that I, I do, uh, the less I'm able to predict who I'll need increased constraint in. And uh, that decision is going to be dominated by the MCL, and I, I just am having a hard time predicting. So you want to have constrained condylar and maybe even a hinge available. Yeah, I think it's definitely on that end of the spectrum. Uh, probably all would agree that you go with the least amount of constraint you need, but this is probably varus valgus constraint at a minimum and have the hinge um, r there. to. And if she's 88, um, I think it'll be that'll that'll work fine for her the the uh, thing I'd be con most concerned about with trying to correct it uh, without a hinge or, or semi-constrained is that you put the perineal nerve at great deal of risk here it's valgus and flexion deformity and the perineal nerve is lateral and posterior so what happens is as you correct both of those deformities into extension and varus, you're stretching the perineal nerve both ways. Now you've got an MCL that's over lengthened, so if you, that is lengthened beyond its physiologic length, it's stretched out. So if you just did enough of a release, theoretically, of everything laterally and balance the knee, you would lengthen the leg beyond its physiologic length and you would lengthen the nerve beyond its physiologic length plus wherever it's starting from now. So the nice thing about the constrained situations is you can shorten the leg to correct the deformity instead of lengthening the leg and lengthening the nerve. And you inherently, um, you know, intend to treat it like a, a, a knee that just doesn't have an MCL in the first place. And that probably is going to be a hinge then. That, that, that does better with a hinge than with a semi-constrained. So I would probably just go directly to a hinge and whack off enough bone of the femur to straighten it out with somewhat of a lateral release, but um, not really intending to uh, balance the knee in any way. Yeah, I think those are all great points. And the, the few patients that I have had who have had temporary perineal nerve palsies are the valgus with the flexion deformity. Uh, the pure flexible valgus, I think, are less likely to have trouble, but it's, it's the combination of the two that you need to be worried about. Also, minimal tibial resection to start with in general, because especially if you're going to do a PS on your way to a CC, the gap in flexion tends to open up quite a bit when you resect their PCL. So if you over-resect the tibia, you're going to be looking at a pretty big extension gap. Should we do one more? We're almost at 4 o'clock. Yeah, we're close. Okay. One more quick one? Yeah, go for it. All right, so this is a 45-year-old male firefighter. Uh, he was involved in a multi-trauma, and uh, he uh, ended up getting an infected distal femoral nonunion. Um, and he had had multiple debridements, and uh, my traumatologist partner uh, brought him to me and said, uh, do you think you can help me out with him? Um, so he's definitely infection-free. He has a long lateral incision. Um, and uh, the issues here uh, that were uh, pertinent would be um, long lateral incision, are you going to use that and do a lateral parapetellar, do a, uh, your standard uh, midline incision and a medial parapetellar, uh, challenges with exposure, and then most importantly, how are you going to manage the bone loss and his limb length? So uh, just so we're clear, there's a bunch of distal femur missing here. Right? Yes. <laughs> a bunch. <laughs> Is this a trick? <laughs> no, this is, there's no tricks here. So Honestly, does, no is there anything kind of holding him together, like an external fixator? Yeah, he's got his external fix on now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Well, I'm. I guess he is out to length. <laughs> he is close. That's helpful, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And the pins are all clean and dry yeah. and not. Yeah. He, he's been debrided several times, including one that had a couple liter blood loss. So it's pretty thoroughly done. Okay. Um, what do you guys think about uh, you know, whatever the reconstruction is? Uh, with the pins in place, uh, would you want that fixator off for a while? Uh, it seems to me that's a little bit of a risk factor. It's I get really nervous with those pins and just going straight to the next thing. But yeah. um, I don't know, you know, if you take the pins out and his leg just flops around, uh, it's going to be kind of tough for him, too. Um, yeah, so I actually I told them to get the X fix out, and then I wouldn't do it for eight weeks after that because of my yeah. concern, too. And what's I've been, I've been burned that? with that. What's that uh, radio lucency there? Is that is there methacrylate or is that just heterotopagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosphagosph